a very good morning to you. I hope you're going to enjoy another short presentation by ZS6YI. Today, the topic is a novel approach to constructing the Q0100 ground station. I just wish to take this opportunity of also thanking Matthias, DD1US, for assisting with uh, many photographs. Uh, when I started doing this presentation, I fell ill with COVID and Matthias contacted me, we've been in daily contact, and he said, look, I've got a lot of photos. I've done a similar type of presentation uh, on Q0100. Use whatever you need out of there. So Matthias, thank you very, very much. It is highly appreciated. Uh, the agenda today is firstly a little bit of background info on Q0100, and then we'll look at some down converters, we'll look at some up converters, different stations, just so that you can get a feel of what these stations look like, and then we'll move on to the novel station, a term coined by Hans ZS6AKV. The geostationary satellite ESL2 carrying amateur radio transponders launched from Kennedy Space Center at 2046 GMT on Thursday, November 15, 2018, and is now in a geostationary orbit at 25.9 degrees east. These are the first amateur radio transponders to be put into a geostationary orbit, and they are expected to link radio amateurs from Brazil to Thailand. ESL2 carries two phase four amateur radio transponders operating in the two 0.4 gig band and the 10.45 gig bands. A 250 kilohertz band with linear transponder intended for conventional analog operation has now been superseded. It's been widened to 500 uh, kilohertz and an 8.5 megahertz bandwidth transponder for experimental digital modulation schemes and DVB amateur television. Um, the footprint, as can clearly be seen from these two slides, Q0100 has a huge footprint covering the whole of Europe, UK, Greenland, most of Asia, even as far as Hong Kong, India and Israel. The satellite also covers parts of the northeastern section of South America, and recently my friend Ed Papayanki 2 Radio November had a QSO with a student in Hong Kong. That's some distance. The satellite could not be better placed for Africa and in particular South Africa. Virtually every square inch of Africa is covered, but we have far too few ZS amateurs on the bird. Since about 18 months ago, only Leon, ZS1 Mike Mike and myself has been on DATV. About three weeks ago, I helped Frank, ZS6 Golf Echo, come onto DATV. So now at last we have three ZS hams on DATV and one chap in Mauritius. We are eager to assist more chaps to come onto this wonderful mode. Okay, I think it's time to get practical now. We've seen what the satellite can do. And now we look at antennas for Q0100. Now you don't need huge dishes. Uh, originally it was designed for about an 800 millimeter or 80 centimeter dish, and that should have worked quite well, which it does. Uh, yeah, some uh, photos that you can see of different ideas, different types of methods and dishes to get onto the bird. Even the helix, right hand turn, of course, in this case, if you want to go nano band. And uh, it works. I speak to a couple of guys uh, through the dish, uh, through, through the satellite, just running one of these helixes. And uh, you don't need a lot of power. That's another nice thing. You can, okay, I run a big dish about a 2.4 meter and another one, a 1.8 meter for narrowband. And I run maybe half a watt, sometimes a watt uh, output. And that's more than enough to get a signal equivalent in strength to the beacon. That's one thing I must also add. We do not want to go higher than the beacon because we're trying to conserve power. So if you go higher than the beacon, you have a, a, an alarm that descends upon you instantly and it's called Lila and it works very really well and uh, you are shamed so try and keep your your power level below that i know i have been shamed often and i don't say that with any glee but uh, try and keep the power level just to about the level of the beacon and you should have a perfectly 
good signal. So that's that's uh, the one slide showing some antennas. We'll show a few more on the next slide. This is the antenna used by DD1US, the chap that sent me a lot of photographs, Matthias. He's a director of AMSAT. And then on the right is my dear friend Charlie, a DK3ZL. Charlie spent a few days with me uh, last year, uh, February. And uh, he's quite a tall guy, he's well over two meters. And you can see the size of the dish in the background there. He's pointing to a feed that I developed, um, which is quite uh, novel in its own way. I actually use a laser to get that thing perfectly in line with the dish. Anyway, uh, on the left hand bottom is my 1.8 meter dish that I use now for the narrow band and the bigger dish I use for wide band. Uh, that's a prime focus dish, uh, solid prime focus, works very well and uh, not too different to the mesh type at our frequencies anyway. So uh, there we go. I hope uh, we'll show you some feeds in the next slide. This is uh, my modification of the potty. What I did was I made a ring out of aluminium uh, so that this ring could sit on a prime focus dish. I then also put an N-type connector onto the patch side. And then uh, on the right hand side, I made a, a nice little plug that I could get everything lined up. Once it was lined up and onto the dish, I removed the plug and then put in a collinator, which I was gifted by ZS4U, old man Barney. I think he's now ZS5U. I'm not sure if he's ZS5 call sign. But anyway, Barney gave me this beautiful collinator, which is used on telescopes, setting up telescopes. So what I do is I put the collinator in and I can turn it around and the laser must beam right into the center of the dish. And as you turn the collinator, it mustn't move off. And then if it doesn't, it means this whole thing is perfectly lined up. And so that's how I line up the dishes to get the maximum efficiency to make sure that my feed is spot on in the middle and that it uh, illuminates the dish properly. Right, now we've got the antenna. We want to listen to something we want to receive. So let's start with the easiest way, which is just an SDR. We call it down converter, but an SDR receiver that can receive in the region of about 739, 740 megahertz, and you're good to go. So there are many types on the market. We haven't even nearly touched all the types, but you've got the RTL, you've got the FunCube, your ASPY, etc. Uh, at the bottom, the DX Patrol, SDR Play, a good one, and again, the ASPY 2. There are more. Ah, you can have a whole sequence of events, a whole lecture just on these things. But what it is, it's really just a receiver. So you go from your LNB, which down converts to around about 740 megahertz, round figures. You then Pop that into your RTL or your SDR receiver. You go into your computer and you should be able to tune in that frequency and you can actually listen to the satellite. Now, when I started, I, um, I had a very nice SDR duo and got everything connected, got my little dish on a tripod next to me. And lo and behold, more or less figured out what the frequency should be and tuned and tuned and tuned and nothing happened. Okay, I eventually carried my uh, big ICOM uh, 9800 or 9500 receiver down, put it on the table, connected everything, and tuned and tuned and moved the dish, and nothing happened. So eventually I wanted a cup of tea, I went to my wife, I said, yeah, I don't know if this darn thing is working, I wonder if the satellite's on. Anyway, I had a cup of tea and came back, and lo and behold, you have to couple a little... Um, power supply to your LNB and you go through a thing called a bias T which is nothing other than just a filter and uh, as I popped out I'm going to sit in the stoop again and see what I can do I noticed I never ever switched on my blooming LNB popped it on and within seconds I had fantastic signals on the ICOM and then I stopped the ICOM because then I didn't need a SDR unit. I didn't even need a computer. It was direct from the dish, feed uh, through uh, the LNB, a little uh, bias T and uh, into the ICOM at 739 megs, whatever. Right, so then I tried my uh, RST, uh, my, my dual, uh, SDR dual, 
and it worked beautifully on the computer, in fact better than on the uh, analog unit. And then I was receiving the satellite as strong as possible and uh, no issues. So uh, what's the lesson learned? Check everything before you go nuts and start moving your antenna. Right, the next slide will be to show you how it all works connected. Right, if we look at this slide, it's a down converter really. Sorry about the noise there, it's a down converter. We have our antenna and then we go through our LNA, bandpass filter, mixer, blah, blah, blah. All that in white from the 10 gigs LNA to the bandpass filter is actually just all included in your little phase lock loop LNB. Uh, we do sometimes throw out that little oscillator and <clears throat> we put in our own oscillator, chuck out the crystal, the 25 meg or so crystal, and put a uh, Leo Bodner disciplined oscillator in there, G a GPS disciplined oscillator. Makes that very stable because as temperature goes, these things drift. For TV, it doesn't matter. They can drift a megahertz, who cares? But not when you're going to work SSB or FT8. So we prefer to um, actually add a piece in there and uh, throw out the crystal. I think I do attend to that later and you can have it very, very stable. However, the output of this lot, you can either take to an analog receiver like I did with the ICOM 9500 receiver or you could go through an SDR, plug it into your computer and you are watching your satellite. It's actually very easy. It's not difficult at all. And uh, just remember, make sure you've got your bias T on. <laughs> And uh, the right frequencies, because that's another thing. Yes, uh, tuning your antenna, your satellite, you've got some nice software on your phone that you can sort of locate where the satellite should be and make sure there's not a branch in the way. And then uh, once you've got a clear view to the satellite, you're cooking. So that's how we would receive the satellite uh, for starters. Uh, this is a typical example of a commercial down converter, Secuni Electronics. Uh, I have one, I found that it was off frequency, although stable, so I uh, put a GPS discipline oscillator into the bias T, fed that up to the QD, and now it's very stable and on frequency, works very well, it down converts to 400 megs, 433 megs, and so I can track it with the ICOM 9700, I can track my transmit uplink as well as the downlink, so it's like just using a normal transceiver on SS on, on, on 14 megs. Uh, this is a Q100 setup by DG2SPL. He's using an analog transceiver, and uh, he then goes from the dish in the yellow portion, let's just follow that quickly, that's the downlink. He goes through a little transverter that can convert it down to two meters, as well as to 739 megs, and from there he goes through an uh, RSP1A uh, into the um, SDR console program. So he has basically two receivers connected to this, uh, the analog one on the left and the SDR on the right. And then the uplink, he goes through a little attenuator just to make sure that he doesn't pop, put more than about five watts into the SG lab transverter, which uplinks and then goes through a 20 watt amp, but you don't necessarily have to run it at 20 watt and then into his uh, patch part of the potty onto the dish. And that's the way he uh, gets a signal in and out of the uh, satellite. A very nice setup, nice and neat, and it works very well. Talking about up converters now to get a signal into the satellite at 2.4 gigs, a very cost effective method is to use the DX Patrol. And so you uh, put in a signal from either 28 megs right through to 1.2 gigs. You've got a little plug there in the dip switch that you can change things. Um, and then you uh, maybe drive it with maximum about four watts. And that gives you about a hundred milliwatt more or less output. And from there you go to an amplifier and to your antenna and that's your uplink. So you can use any analog transceiver or transmitter actually to get the signal on the bird. Okay, another solution is to use the SG Labs up converter, very nice unit, uh, more filtering than on the DX Patrol and a nice screened shielded uh, box that it comes in. Um, works very well, very similar to the DX Patrol, perhaps a little bit more on the upmarket side, it costs a little bit more as well. And from there you can then go to an amplifier, they have a nice 20 watt amp 
So that's a nice solution. And I know Adi, uh, I've got one as well. And so does Adi ZS6CNC. And he's putting through a very, very acceptable signal into the satellite with many good compliments on quality. Right, this is considered now top of the range or the Rolls Royce of up converters, the Oscar Phase 4 up converter. Uh, I have the later model, just one after this. It looks exactly the same. They uh, did a change in the circuit. It works very well. Can put out 20 amp, uh, 20 watts rather, <laughs> 20 watts if you needed to. I run mine uh, at around about a half a watt to one watt maximum, because I have a big antenna with high gain, so I don't need more power than that. And therefore, everything runs ice cold. Uh, I have the CUNY up converter and down converter as well as the ICOM 9700 all locked with one GPS unit, GPS disciplined oscillator, which we'll show you in the next slide. Keeps everything very, very stable, uh, on frequency, no drift, and uh, it's, it's akin to working a normal 20 meter SSB signal, but on the satellite. That's one of the challenges is, of course, to get everything stable and on frequency. And once you've got that done, you've got it aced. So there we go. This is the Oscar Phase 4 up converter from CUNY. Of course, they also have the down converter and the BIAS T. Uh, as I say, it works very, very well. Right, I have mentioned the GPS disciplined oscillators uh, previously. Uh, I believe it's a very, very important part of a satellite station because it keeps things very, very accurate. You have two types, the uh, Leo Bodner Mini on the left and the Leo Bodner Dual on the right. I prefer the Mini because the Dual, although it says Dual and you've got two outputs, uh, the one output is directly dependent on the other output. So uh, you can't have two totally independent frequencies. And so therefore, I'd rather use the Mini. They are programmable. You can get them to any frequency from around about 400 hertz to about 800 megahertz. Very, very stable, a 0, 0.601 hertz, which is very, very good. Don't forget, you multiply many times by 390 just to get to the LMB uh, frequency of 10 gig. And so uh, even one hertz out, uh, it's 300 hertz out at the end. So <clears throat> this keeps the station very, very nicely on frequency, and it's invaluable in a satellite type station. Right, this is the ubiquitous Pluto, and on top we have the Lime SDR, but I'm more interested in the Pluto. It's a nice block diagram. You go from your Pluto, a little preamp out, and then another preamp for whatever reason. I don't really agree with that. Long piece of coax cable, and then to the Chinese amp, which I also don't really recommend, and then into the dish, and then from the dish, back you go through your bias t of course to keep the uh, lnb going and back to the pluto it's a nice little transceiver we do do a fair amount of modifications to the pluto to get it to really work properly we change the um, the base frequency from uh, down to 70 megs up to about uh, six gigs so one change and then there's certain changes to the software to be able to accommodate DATV, for example so there's a lot more to it than just the Pluto. There's a, a lot of software changes, etc. But it's a very good and versatile thing. Uh, of course, we do throw out the uh, two and a, what's it, 25 parts per million stability oscillator it has at 40 megs, and rather replace that with a GPS discipline oscillator. Or you can now get an oscillator that runs at 40 megs with a 0, 0,1 parts per million stability, which is fine. It might not still be on frequency, funny enough, but at least it's stable. So there's uh, many ways to, to kill the cat there. Uh, it works very well, and it's ideal for the type of ground station I developed later. Right, we now with the Pluto board. I thought I just want to show you the board, take off the little plastic enclosure, which is not really good. You don't want a plastic enclosure, but however, this uh, Pluto consists of a few field programmable gate arrays and you can of course then flash it and change the uh, frequency range we do from go from 70 to to 6 gigs more or less and um, reflash that and also put in other programs to be able to control this thing a little bit better anyway um, we 
uh, have a couple of mods that we do onto this board. We put a PTT on the right hand side just above the DDR3L. There's a few holes there. That's where we put the PTT with a read relay and a little transistor to drive it and take that to uh, bring a linear to, to ground and away you go. Another change we do is we turf out the oscillator. At one stage, we, at, at, at this stage, when you buy them, they're about 25 parts per million, which is useless. We then chuck it out. And uh, eventually, as the technology improves, we're down to 0.1 parts per million that you can solder in. And um, it works very well. It's not necessarily on frequency. Sometimes you still got to pull it on frequency, but it stays there. Uh, the other alternative is to chuck that out and put a GPS disciplined oscillator in and then just properly terminate the end that goes to the uh, phase lock loop so that uh, you have the right impedance and keep your your uh, noise down as low as possible because that, that, can, that can interfere quite negatively with the thing. So we keep our phase noise as low as possible by terminating the GPS disciplined oscillator correctly. Uh, other things we did is uh, change the voltage points and some of the earth points um, could have caused earth loops and sometimes was unstable. And then down at the bottom, uh, it uses a USB 2 driver, a 2 port. I don't like that. It's a pity in this modern age that we couldn't go USB 3. So I don't use that at all. I use a network cable and then go to a little adapter into that port. And by doing that, of course, I've got no voltage onto the thing now. So I use the right hand little plug and give it nice stabilized five volts. The beauty is I can now take that Pluto and put it right next to the mast. I don't have issues with coax cable losses, etc., because everything is nice and close. And I just use a USB port and I can plug it into the computer and away we go. Now, uh, some of the things like if you take this AD9363, uh, I put a heat sink on that uh, uh, just to keep it a bit cooler. And then I decided, no, I don't want that heat sink there because it's interfering. So I tried to remove the heat sink and successfully remove the whole IC. Now that wasn't too clever. And with that IC coming off, I also damaged the board. So now that whole Pluto is a parts thing, a uh, spare parts thing because you can't really repair the board so easily. But I also noticed I didn't solder those things on very well. However, be that as it may, it's uh, one of the things on of the things that happens when you don't know what you're doing, I suppose. Right, um, <clears throat> this is just a, a guy that's taken out the board, the Pluto, and he's put it into a sort of an aluminium enclosure, which is a better thing to do because, you know, you are dealing with RF at the end of the day. And as I have mentioned earlier, we must always try to keep the RF principles in hand. Uh, there's no substitute for that. So, uh, right, the guy's um, built it into a little enclosure. He's uh, still going to finish it up. He's got his 5 volt regulated little power supply up there, which, uh, by the way, I don't like. I prefer to go with a normal power supply and then use an old traditional stabilizing transistor. And, um, and the reason is because these little buck converters man i've had many things pop because they go nuts so uh, i turf them out i don't use them where possible and they're noisy so i just go with a normal power supply uh, close to the voltage i want and then use an old-fashioned regulator a nice fat cap and away you go and let me tell you it's a lot safer and better so okay that's uh, one guy's way of doing it with his pluto and it works no doubt this is another example of what one can do to get onto the bird. Uh, this is particularly a DATV setup. So the BATC receiver is also known as a mini tuner. The guy's running a Lime SDR and then uh, out to the, uh, to the antenna. Uh, nice little setup, a lot of wiring all over the place. Uh, many satellite stations look just like that. Lots of wires and things all over the place. And, not entirely neat, but this guy can at least close the door and then everything does look very neat. And it works, that's the main thing. This is a very neat setup built by ZS1II, Almain George's. Uh, very, very nicely done. Uh, he's split it into the RF power amplifier, the up converter, and then he had uh, his power supply. Um, nice, well done, 
looks neat and tidy inside and it works like a bomb. I've had quite a few QSOs with him and he's really done a, a great job. So that's another way of doing it. Um, nice station indeed and well done to George there. This is a reasonably compact uh, receiver, transceiver actually, <clears throat> for the ATV. You start with the power supply number one and then um, number five is the uh, mini tuner model two, I think, the second version. And then number three is his amplifier. And uh, it works quite nicely. N nice unit when the lid's on. It's nice and compact looking. On the right hand side is another example of a satellite transceiver. Uh, this one uses the DX Patrol, goes up on uh, 430 megs. Uh, and then on the right to that, he has a, an amplifier. In fact, this looks like the SG Labs amp uh, with a fan on top of it. And he has a down converter on the left and then the power supply down at the bottom. Also neat and it works. This is my friend... Uh, Mateus, a DD1US is set up, which he's built outside so that his shack's nice and clean and made a nice little board, uh, you know, nice box with fans on and a, and a nice little uh, setup so that he doesn't get any water into this lot. Spent a lot of time thinking about it, doing it properly. Neatly done. Uh, he sings on different shelves and uh, he's using the lime in this particular case. I think we did show a photo of it earlier or parts of it. Anyway, what's nice is he can close the board, it's outside the shack, and then from there he goes to his antennas, and uh, his, his table is actually very clean. Works very well. I've had a lot of QSOs with uh, Mateus, and um, that's another way of doing it, is to have it outside, and uh, self-contained, and works like a bomb. So you see many, many different ways to doing this. Neat setup this one is. Right, this is my own setup. Um, on the left is Charlie, a DK3ZL. He's a medical doctor. He spent some time with me in February, as mentioned earlier. You saw him standing at the dish. And he operated both CW and uh, SSB running the ICOM. On the right-hand side slide, you'll see the ICOM. You can see part of the CUNE, which I've built into the console. I try to keep it neat. I've got a nice uh, SWR meter, which can go to about three gigs. Um, I was stupid. I bought one when I was visiting my grandson in the UK. They only had five left. And I wish I'd bought all five because I could have brought them back to South Africa and helped the guys here. Anyway, nowadays we do uh, SWR meeting uh, measurements with a different system uh, and in fact, more accurate. However, <coughs> with the, uh, the, the, uh, 9700 and the up and down converters i don't need a computer but i still had the computer on a separate dish with the um, rsp duo receiver so that we could also monitor our own signal and there you can see it on the screen uh, you can see the waterfalls and so forth anyway charlie had a lot of fun and he liked using the uh, the station it was more comfortable than his uh, station he had to put up every time. And with the 2.4 meter dish, he uh, pumped, pumped through some decent signals and uh, caused many, many, <laughs> um, shall we call it, pileups. It was good fun while it was there. And Charlie had a good time. Anyway, that's, that's my, shall we call it, base station. And it works very well. This is just another view of my base station. In the middle, the IC9700 running the CUNY app converter and then a separate receiver running the SDR console on top so that we can monitor our own signal at all times. That is preferable to do it that way so that you know where you're going. Once again, a different type of station. This is also homemade, uh, beautifully done. And uh, to the right is the, uh, the guy still working so you can't complain about the uh, components on the desk. That's typical when you're playing around with satellites. 99% of the time your desk looks like that. It's only when you take a photograph it's cleaned up. But that's a nice system this guy's got there and uh, also works very well. That's Fox 4 Victor United Delta. So again, a different approach to the same problem. Right, at last we get to the guts of the thing and that was uh, my base station. You've seen the different stations. 
Now, what you saw in the different stations are basically having the palm of my hand with this little photo that you see there. It is a 2.4 gig DAT fee transmitter. I can receive, but then I have to change the uh, software, which is a bit of a nuisance. So at this moment, it's a 2.4 gig DATV transmitter. It's an SSB exciter and receiver. And this is the article. I, I wrote an article for the journal for D, uh, AMSAT DL, which was published this month, I think, or earlier, yeah, towards the end of last month. Funny enough, I've even got my first copy. So uh, that, that was published and apparently uh, very well received. Uh, what, what's nice with this unit is it's small, it's compact, and it does everything you've seen above. Now, I'm already designing version 2 after discussing with um, Matthias. I'm going to uh, add a new mini tuner uh, Mark II receiver. Uh, it'll only make this little thing stand another, say, 25 millimeters higher. And then I'll have not only the 2.4 gig DATV transmitter, but I'll also have the receiver that can be used at the same time. Another modification I'm going to do to this is I'm going to add in a, another bias T so that I can switch the voltages on the LNV between 12 volt and 18 volt for horizontal and vertical polarization. And then I'm going to uh, throw out the 5 volt uh, power supply that I've got in this one, which we'll see just now. And I'm putting in a 12 volt power supply but with two terminals that you can run off a battery and then reduce that through a conventional transistor regulator down to 5 volt. Doing that makes this thing very, very versatile. You can use it for camping, and it's, it's in your palm of your hand. It's only about 150 millimeters by maybe about 100 millimeters, and uh, it will be a bit thicker than this one. This one's around about 50 millimeters high, might go to 70 millimeters, doesn't matter. So let's take you through how we actually produce this, uh, the unit, and you can see how we manufactured it quite easy. Right, so the entire unit was manufactured from a solid piece of aluminium. We put this on CAD, of course, worked out where all the fastening holes must be, and took special precautions to make sure that each stage is properly shielded because that's the important thing. That's why people have them on their desks, long pieces of wire. And then, of course, we used uh, the proper coaxial, um, semi-rigid coax with the proper terminal so that you get no RF leakage at all. Comes back to basic uh, microwave technology. Uh, this particular slide is just showing where we did uh, some of the holes. Um, in that particular case, we were milling out the amplifier Subsequently, that amp, which is only about a 2 watt amp, has been replaced with a 6 watt amplifier. So this unit can work into the satellite quite comfortably with no other amp. If I use the amp that uh, we have modified from Saro, we can uh, then cut out the 6 watt amp completely, but then you have another little unit, and that unit must take 28 volts. So, okay then it's not so portable anymore, but you can get to 28 volt if you want to go through a big buck up converter, if you want to go portable on a DATV. But on the 6 watt amp, it's great, it's fine, um, not too hot, and it works. Right, so this is just us uh, drilling some holes after the complete unit was uh, put on CAD and then CNC milled. I am looking at a different way of casting the the aluminium rather, making a pattern and then casting that maybe sand cast and then um, I can produce a few of these things uh, far easier and just cut away a little bit of the excess metal to make it look good. So that's just another uh, way of looking at, at solving a similar problem. But uh, it works well and uh, there's no interaction. It's done properly, shielded properly, but we'll come to that in the next minute. This is a little unit as it was milled. You can see some islands in the inside there. That's where your different uh, boards would be fastened to. Um, of course, the outputs, uh, PTT, RF in, RF out, and uh, external GPS disciplined oscillator in there. And then to the right, we have the space for the amplifier, which has going to be changed going forward. <clears throat> That'll just be a solid block with the in and output. And then, of course, your switches and your, your toggle on and off and a little LED. 
and behind that uh, are the ports for the Leo Bodner and of course the power supply. Right, this is the complete unit um, and we played around with our laser engraving. That's where the 2.4 gig DATV and SSB exciter came. And then uh, we added later on, uh, we made it also the SSB receiver. And uh, the front part with the call sign is that was milled out in a traditional way that was not laser cut. I was still playing with the laser. Uh, on the front, you can see uh, like the PTT, etc. cetera, uh, all those uh, were laser cut. We um, had to cover the aluminum and then laser cut it and then wipe it off. However, uh, we did a few changes after that, but it's a neat little unit ready to go. I showed Leon ZS1MM and he was quite impressed with the unit, although he came up with a suggestion which we'll talk about in a second. This is now the complete unit. It's got its power supply built in, it's got its uh, Leo Bodner in, it's got its uh, amplifier and of course in the Pluto. And then <clears throat> you'll see, for example, on the right hand side with the Pluto, we made a little plate because it was difficult to get it in. So uh, we, we made a separate plate that could cover that so the thing was properly RF shielded, worked like a bomb. And the same thing with the GPS antenna, there is an extra plate that goes in and then that uh, neatens it up and very well shielded. Uh, we can run this thing now at the moment of 12 volt, uh, sorry, uh, 220 volt. Or if you want to, you can put in 5 volt, but 5 volts not so easy when you're camping. So that's going to change to 12. A few other changes coming in. So that's the complete unit uh, in its position. And uh, then, as I said, Leon said, oh, it look nice if you could rather um, uh, anodize this thing, because anodizing uh, is better than um, other methods of, of coating aluminium. It's very hardy, except it's not uh, a very good conductor of electricity at all. And, and of course, not even RF. So I had to work around that, but it worked well. There were other ways of doing it as phosphating it, but phosphating scratches very easily. However, phosphating has the advantage that it is uh, very well conductive. So uh, in the end, I went for anodizing, but you'll see it looked uh, not too bad. This is the unit now installed after anodizing and you will notice that wherever there were interfaces like the lid we masked that so that the anodizing couldn't get there and then in any event just sanded it up so that it was uh, a proper RF shield and uh, if you look at the Pluto there you will see some of the modifications for example you will see the little PTT uh, read relay and that runs through to the left hand side and that's just the PTT out and um, with the connectors all in place now, ready for the cabling to make it nice and neat, tidy, and no cables running up and down. It's all tidy, neat, and out of the way. And of course, everything is RF shielded. So that's basically what the final article looked like. I'd like to just show you the box without the, uh, the things in, power supply, etc. So let's look at that quickly. Right, this is the box before we uh, added anything into it, just to show you that we um, made sure that wherever there was an earth or an interface or something like that, that it was properly sanded down clean and to, to make it RF tight. That's, that's important with this thing. Um, and then we used the laser uh, scanner that we've got. It's actually a laser cutter to do the PTT and, and the little labeling. It came out quite nice, actually, not too bad. And uh, so that is uh, what it looks like uh, without the um, hardware fitted and it fits like a bomb. And then the next slide will show you the final article. Right, once again, without the hardware fitted, but now with the lid. So this is a complete unit, uh, all came together quite nicely, all interfaced properly. Now it's just a matter of fitting the hardware like you saw earlier and we're good to go. And uh, we'll show you that in the meantime. Right, at last, the final unit with everything in and connected and ready to work. And it does. It works very, very well. What's nice is I use the um, Pluto uh, com a program, which was developed by F5OEO uh, and uh, also modified by Roberto. 
<clears throat> so now you can switch uh, either between DATV or you can switch between the narrowband, the SSB stuff, just with a click. Uh, you do have to reset the Pluto, which is fine. You do it on the software that's just reset it to, to ground level, and then you load up the next program on SDR console, and uh, it works very, very well. Uh, puts out enough power. Box does not get hot. Enough heat sinking for the uh, 6 watts. In, the, in this case, it's only 2 watts uh, peak, uh, but 1 watt mostly. But even so, it's uh, well, well heat sinked enough. To, to, to handle the six watts. Um, if you want to go more, you use that to drive the amp, the 250 watt Amplion amp that I built some time back. I wrote an article, uh, I think in ZS6TJ magazine, so uh, we can show photos of that sometime. But anyway, that's what it looks like. Now let's just go and see some of the results because that's what counts. Right, this is now on the narrowband side. And I wanted to check what it was like against the uh, the satellite. And as you can see, my delta is 1 hertz, minus 1 hertz. Then it jumps eventually to plus 1 hertz. So that's not bad at all. Um, if you think 1 hertz on 10 gigahertz, I mean, now we're talking business. And that's because everything's nice and shielded. It's temperature controlled. You've got a GPS discipline oscillator. It's uh, running the Pluto at 40 megs and... Um, what more do you want? It's running like a bomb. Works well and it's very accurate and it's, cons you know, you, you, it's repeatable. You just switch it on and you work. The next slide, I wanted to show you the amplifier that we use on a DATV. Right, this is the amplifier as received from Saro, um, BU3 OBR. Um, with a little change to his board, we uh, changed some of the resistors and reset the bias correctly, as mentioned earlier. This little amplifier works fantastically well, um, easily puts out 150 watts, but you never need that. Um, we probably run between 30 and 50 watts on DATV, uh, and it's more than adequate. It's right up there where the beacon is. You don't want to go higher than that. So there's a lot of reserve power uh, with around about 35 to 40 dB uh, headroom before we start seeing any regrowth at the bottom, which is actually very good indeed. So that proves that we are running properly in a class A. There's your PTT button uh, that you plug into your Pluto, if you wish, a 28 volt, of course, plus and minus DC. Uh, and then you just plug in your RF uh, on the left hand side there, you'll see in and on the right hand side out. Now, this has not been boxed yet. It's just as it is. I, I actually place that on a big piece of copper with some water cooling. So I keep it accurate to within about two degrees Celsius. No matter if I run 10 minutes on wideband, um, it, it rises to maybe 20 degrees from around about 17 or 16.9, 17 degrees up to about maybe 20 degrees. And that's where it stops. It doesn't go any higher than that. But what I'm doing is I'm using a very big, a chilling unit, a temperature controlled unit that we use on molds for injection molding. So it's a bit of an overkill, cost a lot of money, but in the end I'm running different amps and stuff off that, so it actually becomes a cheap thing. And But you are dead stable, electronics is cold, and it can take 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as you want. Nothing gets hot, your PC board doesn't get hot, so it's, it's working very well. Nice amp, um, I've got about five or six of them now, Goodness knows what I, I am with Frank said is uh, 6GE got one from me the other day. So uh, anyway, there they are. I'll keep a few spares and uh, make a few, maybe the SARL, make them a nice DATV transceiver sometime so that they can transmit bulletins and etc. But anyway, that's the amp. If you want to use an external amp, small, tidy, e easy, you just need 28 volts. You can buy one power supply. Um, very seldom go over 5 amps, actually 5 point, maybe 6 amps. If you really want to push it, you can go up to 15 amps, but ugh, you never get there. You, you, you uh, knock the satellite out of its orbit. So all within nice means and a lot of headroom. And again, you want to engineer that headroom into your electronics so that things run cool and it runs a long time and uh, you don't have hassles. That's the main thing.
this is my test pattern, which I transmitted up to the satellite at 35,000 kilometers and came back to me another 35,000 kilometers, and that's the quality of the uh, picture. No ghosting, no uh, degradation in lines, uh, high definition. Uh, that was on uh, a thousand or one mega symbol, of course. Uh, you won't get that clarity on 333, uh, not quite. But anyway, that's what's possible on the satellite. So that, that little picture has gone 70,000 kilometers. Not bad. Coming back, and that is exactly in real life. So as I'm transmitting, I'm also receiving so that we could uh, check the quality, etc. I'm quite satisfied with that. Um, you can't really improve much on that, I don't think. So uh, we're happy. It's uh, working to plan, and it's an excellent quality signal to be putting out with that little unit. Now, I had a look at the, the um, test pattern directly as I received it. And then I looked at it via this um, blue jeans thing. And the blue jeans degrades the quality dramatically. So it's actually a lot better than what you have been seen via blue jeans. In fact, we should have this type of thing on the satellite. That, that will attract international attention and also uh, be higher quality than this blue jeans thing. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, these are two pictures. The one on the left is the spectrum that we get from Gunhilly in the UK. And so you can see in an instant what's on the band. Um, now, you'll see on the left-hand side, that green bit, that is the beacon running at one and a half mega symbols. And then there's a chap transmitting on one mega symbol that tells you there, one MS. And uh, then to the right is a 500 kilo, uh, kilo symbol. And again, another 500. And then you get uh, to the complete right. That's the edge of the other band. That's where we normally sit on a Sunday. And that's where the uh, British Amateur Television Club sits on a Thursday evening um, from about 9 o'clock South African time, p.m. A bit late, but anyway, uh, th that's very interesting to go and have a look at their, their uh, talks and um, experiences during the week. Those guys are very productive, especially in the winter months. They are very productive. But anyway, that gives you a, an idea of some of the signals. The more narrow signals, 66, 125, and even down to... 25, uh, they little little slithers on that screen, but unfortunately I didn't have any to, to, to show there. On the right hand side is a photo um, that was taken. Now this is a long journey. Firstly, it goes up to the satellite, down again, and Roberto, uh, he, he picked it up and then he put it onto YouTube and on the net and also on the uh, live net at the time, you can see it said they're live. Um, and so I streamed that a little bit. And that, that signal, if you think of it, it's gone 70,000 kilos plus another 12,000. So uh, it's, it's into the 80,000 kilometer travel that that uh, picture took. And that was only on 333 kilobits and also an FEC ratio of two thirds, which is nowhere near the high quality. However, you can see on the shirt, the blocks are straight and you can see the the detail on the microphone. And uh, at the back, I've got a spare ICOM 9700. Um, and uh, Adi kindly gave me a cover for it. So it's sitting there. It's quite useful, by the way, when I want to quickly uh, test another up converter. I don't have to go behind the console. And then uh, there's the DATV, which I started with. That uh, is the one from the BATC. Um, works very well, actually. It uses the Lime but subsequently going through to the Pluto became much easier and smaller. So I think uh, that's about wraps up what I wanted to tell you. And uh, I hope you found this relatively interesting. So I'll say 7.3, as I said earlier, I hope you find it quite interesting that you do something similar. Come on the satellite. Of course, I'm touting the DATV side, but not to miss. The narrow band side, there's a lot of spare capacity there. And uh, it works well. We have a couple of hams down in Division 5, uh, a few here in Division 6, a few in Division 1. Um, I'm just trying to think who's in Division 4. Yes, there's two guys in Division 4. <clears throat> so uh, old uh, ZS4 Alpha, I helped him come on the air. He comes on uh, occasionally with a very good signal. 
So uh, it, it's growing, but far too, too little interest at this point of time. And as you can see, it's not difficult. Um, in future, I'll write a couple of more articles, I suppose, to, to help people along. And when this COVID thing comes to an end, we can always bring a unit uh, to uh, a, you know, uh, a chat or a talk group, whether at the SARL or at AMSAT, doesn't matter. And you can actually see the thing and handle it and work it and work through the, the satellite and see how easy it is. And I'd like to see more Zulu Sierra stations coming on. And please, guys, if you need assistance, we're here to assist and to help. Uh, it's almost a national pride thing. I want to see good signals on the satellite, not the ropey stuff from ZS. We, we don't allow that, HI. <laughs> so if there's any assistance needed, of course, we'll help. Right, with that, 7-3, back to you, Hans, from Zulu Sierra 6, Yankee, India, now signing clear.